I'm really, really keen to know how's your week been? Um, yeah, it's been all right. Pretty steady. <laughs> Pretty steady. What's it like knowing that um, your athlete's the strongest man in the world? Oh, it's absolutely nuts. You know, um, I started working with Tom a couple of years ago and said to him, sort of when we started working together, like, you will win world's strongest man. Like, that is going to happen. And then he said, you know, 2021 is the year I win it. And yeah, it went to went to plan. You know, it was, it's just, it's mind blowing. You know, like the opportunities that have come from it in like two days as well. Like, I mean, doing this, like I was listening to your chat with Nims uh, about a week ago and I was like, oh, it's such a good thing. And then like you saw when I, um, you messaged and like your Instagram name, I just didn't really click what it said at the start. Okay. And then I was like, oh, wait, this is, this is that podcast I was listening to. Like, it's just amazing. It's so cool to, you know, be a part of it and be a part of Tom's journey. Well, it's, it's so well deserved. And I've loved following what you've been up to on Instagram since it, since it all happened, since he got, since he got the trophy. But when did your journey start with, uh, with Tom and Luke? When, how did it all come around? What were you doing beforehand? Take us back to the start of your journey with the, with the world's strongest brothers. So I met Tom uh, in Belfast probably five or six years ago, uh, UK's strongest man. I was ho- helping an athlete called Paul Smith, a uh, lad from Sheffield, really good strongman. Um, so I've known Tom for you know quite a while. Um, and Luke was sort of Tom's brother for a long time. And, you know, he was, he was a good strong man, but, you know, Tom's Tom, you know, like if you know Tom, like he's such a big personality to be around that it's easy for people to sort of get lost, lost around it. Um, and then 2019, Tom was at world's strongest man uh, and his luggage went missing. And, I ended up, you know, just helping a mate out, like messaging uh, Rogue and Nike and people, seeing if they could get a pair of size 17 lifting shoes to Florida. And the general consensus was, are you insane? Like, no one needs shoes that big. Um, And then Tom got fifth uh, that year. And sort of straight away, I said, like, that's really good. Well done. But you should be winning this competition. Um, and I sort of said, like, look, I've got a lot of faith in myself as a coach. Give me like three months. Like, I won't charge you. They'll, you know, if it doesn't work out, you don't ever have to talk to me again. Like, let's just see what happens. Um, and I think we put 20 kilos on his deadlift in those three months. So he went from sort of a ropey 400 to pulling 420, uh, I think for a couple of reps, actually. Um, so yeah, we just we've just worked together since then. But what's your your history to, for you to back yourself like that? What what did you have in your armory that you thought I can make this guy world the, the strongest man in the world and, and and get involved in the Stockman culture, get involved in in the legacy that they're building? That you you saw it back then that he can he can go all the way and Luke can do what he just did and just put in the performance yeah. of his life and and things like that. What, what was in you that thought I need to be part of this? Um. It sort of gets a bit deep and heavy, but um, go, for it. go for it. Take us there. When I was, when I was throughout sort of my whole life, I've sort of felt that I will do something. You know, when you just sort of know, like, I wasn't sure what it was. I tried loads of different stuff. Um, in my personal life now, I've sort of gone back into rock climbing where I think, you know, I'm going to do some pretty nuts stuff with that. Um, and I love strongman, but I was not that good at it. But I went to uh, help Paul out at a competition. Well, I went to watch a competition, and I said to him, "Like, why is everyone doing it? Like, I can't remember what the event was, but it's like, why is everyone doing it like this? Where this is just obviously the better way to do it." And he tried what I said and won the event. And I was like, "Well, I, I can just see stuff." differently I think I think with being on the spectrum as well that you know when I have a thought and 
if I'm convinced by it, then I'm pretty convinced by it. Like that's what that's what I'm going to want to do. Okay. And yeah, I had slightly rough time, sort of a self-inflicted rough time where so I've got into taking class A's and stuff like that and tried really hard to kill myself in fun ways. Um, and through all of that, I realized like, if I'm going to bother being here, then I want to try and do amazing things with it and try and help people do amazing things as well. Wow. Okay. So, so you've had a personal journey yourself, let alone what you've been through with the lads. And yeah. The, is that something you talk a bit more about? Because when I had Tom on talking about what he battles and I've had so many guests on talking about their, their own pasts that so many people aren't aware of that you, yeah. you even letting someone into a bit of what you've gone through could help just one person out there. Yeah. So, um, I think because of where I sort of sit on the spectrum that I really struggle to cope with the world. It just feels too sort of too slow. Like my head moves really quick like all the time um like i really struggle to just move in the normal world like even little things like going to a supermarket like i know i'm going from here to here and like i've got it mapped out but when other people are just wandering around i find it really annoying and it's a weird thing to be annoyed about because it's people doing what people do um, and I found uh, when I was a kid, I was smoking like quite a lot of like really strong skunk. And that slowed my brain down enough that the world was all right. Um, and then from there, uh, taking like diazepam and triazepam and like medication, painkillers and sleeping pills to try and deal with the world. Um, and then just heroin because it's the best painkiller in the world like it's the only real painkiller that and it really slows you down <laughs> like yeah. like it, it really brings you down a, a couple of notches so uh sort of got into that drinking really heavily like 20 pints four or five nights a week drinking bottles of like spirits before i'd go out and stuff and just trying to trying as much as possible to bring myself down to the level I thought the world worked at. Um, and when, when, you're then, trying, when you're trying to slow yourself down, could you function with that amount yeah. of alcohol in you? And, and could, could you go out and, and were you going into pubs, clubs? Could, would you be let in? Were you able to walk yeah, yeah. in, able to, able to hold a conversation after drinking that much? And, and do Yeah, it? totally sound. Like wow. it, it was, um, I think it was, I sort of got to the point of, that's I was bringing myself down to sort of how the world is. So I'd drink loads and just seem like a normal, slightly pissed bloke rather than someone who's, you know, totally off their face because I just, because my head's going so quick all the time, it just slowed it down to almost like a socially acceptable speed. So it's, yeah, it's a bit, a bit weird. I try not to drink too much anymore because it it gets out of hand. So so for for someone for what you've been through and and the the challenges that you've faced, having a focus like Tom and Luke, and I'm sure other athletes, and we can talk about other athletes that you you help and and, and look after, but having those guys as um as your athletes. It must be an incredible distraction to what else is going on in your world or else is going on in your head to make sure that they're at peak performance. Yeah, yeah, for sure. What is it like on a day to day or, or, or structuring a program for them, keeping your concentration and, and keeping things sort of dialed in to so they are at their peak, peak so, state of performance when, and they're ready to go when they need to be? Yeah, so I'm sort of, I'm tending to think sort of six weeks ahead of where we are as much as possible um and obviously that time scale will come down the closer we get to major events um but like i've had a chat with luke uh about 20 minutes ago uh and i was like i need to know what you're doing 
until World's Strongest Man starts again. Like we need to know every event that you're planning on either doing or going to because you're Luke Stoltman. And, you know, I function really well if I've got that long-term thing. Yeah. And that becomes like a, a bit of a level. And then all the short-term stuff just fits in rather than trying to constantly battle short-term things. I always, we're working towards world's strongest man. So all the short-term stuff has to in some way contribute to that. Yeah. Yeah. They, they sort of get the boxes ticked on the way to the big event. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think people tend to get really, I mean, distracted and, you know, feel anxious about stuff that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the time it doesn't really matter. Like in the, in the big picture, like there's a lot of room to, if you're moving forward in some way, you're still moving forward. That, that, that's so true. And it's, it's something that I, a lot of people get stuck with that you, you forget when you're in the heat of some trauma or the heat of some pathetic argument or something that's going on that in a year's time, will I even remember this? Yeah. It's... Will this be important around the corner? It's so hard sometimes to just get yourself out of that. And if you've, if you've got methods and ways to, push through the crap, push through the, the roadblocks and just get to that event. I like that. I like yeah. the of that. So come it's, on. Um, oh, but, but, I think, oh, sorry, man. Oh, crack on. Crack, keep going. Keep going. No, I think um, I'm still getting used to interviews and stuff. It, it's been a hectic, <laughs> hectic two days immersion into it. But um, I think, you know, with being into rock climbing and stuff myself sort of quite a lot, it really teaches you that if you're panicking for no reason, you can make yourself be dead, which is a really bad thing to happen. So it makes you become, this is the situation I'm in. This is the process to get out of it and you have to execute it. And I sort of approach everything with the same sort of, same sort of way. And is that something you've instilled on on Tom and Luke that there must be times? Obviously, it it destroys me that the world's strongest man event isn't live on TV. Yeah, you know, it's and, awful. And, and you keep up. To, we'll get into that in a minute. But is that sort of mentality of through these events that the guys have just gone through? There must have been times where they thought, "I've made a mess of this," or "I'm I'm not going to be able to lift this." And have you got techniques and and sort of they've got routines and things through training that they can just rely on and fall back on to get them that next lift to sort of re-energize. So they have 12-ish events to do at World's Strongest Man. And that's 12 individual events. And that's how we view it. So, you know, even Tom or Luke winning an event, send a message like, that was amazing. You've absolutely smashed it. Now you need to go and eat you need to get hydrated, you need to do this, there's another event to do. Mm -hmm. So whether you have a really good performance or it's not quite what you expected, the event's done. Like You don't want to mess up the next event because you're stressing about what's already happened. So we just really focus on that. Each event is its own thing. And you know if you do everything right, then you're still working towards that end goal of, you know, challenging for the title of the world's strongest man. But you don't want to risk that point by dwelling on what's already happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good or bad as well, which people find really weird, I think. What's it like? Um, I've obviously spoken to the guys on the podcast before and the, the brothership, the brotherhood between them is so strong. The bond is so strong. But... As their coach, what is it like competitively between them? Is it quite enjoyable to, to see them sort of go after each other in the gym? Are they, are they like that? And it must, I said this to Amy, obviously we had the um, clinical psychologist, Amy, on the, yes, other, the other day. And just talking about having each other to train with and push each other. What a, what a advantage or, or, you know, benefit to each of them that across the room, they've got one of the best in the world every day looking straight at them pushing them harder pushing them on it must be great to coach that to know that you've got two savages that are yeah. up for it and if you can't be at a session and they've got to look after themselves or or, or push through it you know 
that if one of them's down, the other one picks them up. If one of them's going 100 miles an hour, the other one's chasing them. It must be a great environment. Oh, it's, you know, if you could, if you could bottle it and sell it, you'd make a fortune, you know, like, I'll bet. whatever, like, I've got messages from both of them, like, oh, so-and-so didn't feel great today, but then, you know, the other one hit this. So I went back in and smashed it. Like, they yeah. just don't seem to allow each other to have bad sessions. And, you know, you'll have seen, like, on the YouTube stuff, they've, if they've had bad sessions, we've then analysed what's gone wrong and treated them as a totally individual athlete. But when things are going well and they're competing against each other, then just let that flourish. You know, that needs to that needs to be let to run free. Yeah, and I mean it's their their YouTube channel is is brilliant. It's epic. The and Simon who does all that and edits it all, what he puts together there for that platform for them and, and what they've become. And with the Mulligan yeah. brothers and Amy involved in yourself, that squad, that team is so tight that they've got around them from a couple of lads from the north of Scotland to be where they are now. It's just, it's inspiring, it's incredible. And for, for Tom, for, for what, what he does and what he promotes, and it's just a good, a good news story, isn't it? And that's what the world needs just now, is, is what these guys are achieving. It's, yeah, I mean, you've got two guys who are setting clear goals and will do anything individually to achieve that goal and do anything they can to help the other one do it. Mm-hmm. And they, it's not just them. It's, you know, the going up to visit them and being in the gym, you realize that everyone who walks through those doors is affected by that. Everyone in there, they train harder than, you know, people just going in for a normal gym session. They look absolutely worked afterwards because the energy of the place and the energy of what they're doing is, it's just incredible to be around. It's so interesting as well that for such high level athletes and well known global athletes, world's strongest man's a global event, that they're so welcoming and so generous with their time. Yeah, you know? they're just amazing people. Yeah, they're, they're, they're top level athletes that allow access, they answer calls, they do, sh- you know, they're, they're just so, I mean, yeah. they're just so approachable for, um, yeah, for, for for global athletes, it's, it's it's I'm just I'm still buzzing. I haven't even seen the event yet. I haven't. I'm waiting till Christmas, like everyone else. There's bits and pieces on YouTube, but just so happy for them. And yeah. So, and, and for yeah. you, and, and the way that you talk so honestly, you're getting used to interviews. And the first thing I wanted to do is I've followed you for a while, and I wanted to speak to Amy, who's been in the camp about the mental side, and then you about the strength. And Forgive me, I forget his name, the nutritionist that's Brian Nathan Shaw. Payton. Nathan, Nathan, I'd love to get a chat yeah. with him because... Oh, he's amazing, man. He's so the, good to talk to. To work out how you keep these guys at the size they are, to keep the gen- regenerating the strength year on year, to keep coming back with a mentality. Yeah. It's, it's, it's um, an amazing event. Like with Nathan, I think I put on my story on Instagram yesterday, maybe, that working with Nathan and the lads means that I can basically program stuff that seems a bit impossible. And then the next day program something else that's equally mad. And I know that they'll be ready for it. They just recover so well. They feel great. You know, you can tell if they've had a chat with Amy because the energy is so high straight away that it's, yeah, it's a really good team to to be a part of. How far out do you get to know what events are going to be at World's Strongest Man? well you sort of get an inkling of what they might be and then they can change and they do change or equipment changes or events go wrong so if there's anything really weird I think it's like six weeks we heard what it might be but that's just from athletes chatting about stuff and you know that's pure rumor mill stuff i think it's only two weeks before a week before where we actually got an official this is exactly what it's going to be yeah. and it's pretty pointless getting it at that point because you can't really do a lot so, so your programming is, is it hugely generic to sort of try and cover cover as many bases as possible or do, do mean um luke with his log press tom with the atlas stones they've got specialist events and things that they're best in the world at but all the other bits and pieces, the, the, the keg toss and the, the deadlifting, how do you look at a program? How do you, is it full body 
power, explosiveness? How Pretty you- much. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, Mark Bell and, you know, strength is never a weakness is a pretty good ethos to have as a strong man. Like, be good at everything. Be as strong as possible in as many different ways of moving, either loaded or, like, we knew there'd be, like, you know there's going to be some form of grip event. There'll be some form of overhead. There'll be some form of deadlift. You know, we're pretty, you can guarantee like stones will be in. There'll be usually some form of throw. There'll be some form of loading. So we just get them moving as quickly as possible for the loading stuff. Don't get good at anything. Get good at the event. Don't get good at the implements. What do you mean by that? So people train like, they'll only use sandbags for loading or they'll only use kegs. But that makes you better at loading a keg. It might not necessarily make you better at loading a sandbag or car like last year where they had yeah car parts. Like yeah. You just have to be good at everything in the generic way that means when it has to specialise, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, that, like you that, don't... that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. They turn up a weekend and you've never lifted a car engine or, or, or lifted something awkward. So yeah. you're, you're really looking at a spectrum of if it's heavy and awkward, you need to train with that and be ready yeah. for whatever's thrown at you on the day. Yeah. I mean, the sandbags were wet for a few weeks and they said, like, oh, they're just awkward and slippy. It was like, good. Load them for a couple of weeks. Then when they're dry, it'll feel really easy. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I like it. What, what about the actual event itself? How were you tracking it? Obviously, there was people over there. And did you have? Were you getting some footage? Were you getting feedback? How, how were you uh, up for three days straight? What was what was the your position? I um, I was up from like the first day of the qualifiers, pretty much until uh, yesterday or the day before. Like, um, I'd try and sleep when I could, napping quite a lot, but you know the lads getting up at 6, 7 a.m. their time, I'd make sure they wake up to a message that lets them know what, you know, what they need to be doing through the day. Make sure that I'm on hand all the time, that they're awake pretty much, and then just try and sleep and do what I can here. Um, Officially, we didn't see anything, but we, you know, there were people out there and live videos exist, so we had an idea of what was going on, but then had no times or results. We could just see what was happening. And then uh, the spreadsheet, the almighty spreadsheet kept, kept everyone informed. Kept getting topped up. So what about when you heard it was going down to the last and it was Tom versus Brian Shaw and the Atlas Stones? (sighs) Yeah, it was, uh, (laughs) it's a weird one because there's not, I believe there's not a, strong man on the planet who's ever lived who could beat Tom at Atlas Stones. But what if something, you know, what if his tacky doesn't work? What if the stones are a bit weird? What if they're damp? What, you know, there's a lot of what ifs. Yeah. So there was like 99% pure confidence and then one little voice that just kept going, what if he's not done his laces up though? Like, what about this? Like, yeah. like every possible what if, but you just have to think like if Tom does a good job on stones, there's no one who'll ever beat him. Yeah, was he not eight seconds ahead of Brian Shaw? I think it was twenty seconds to twenty eight. Uh, yeah, eight or nine. He was eleven seconds ahead of him last year. So, I mean, it's what is it? Is it Tom's height? Is it pure strength and ability? What is it about the stones that just he is king of the stones and he's got the world record, he can he can smash the world record when he wants. Like he's told me before that, you know, uh, he won't mind me saying it because he said it on a podcast before, it'll take a big number, a big paycheck for him to keep smashing that. Quite yeah. quite right. Quite right. I'm not just, yeah, just going to do it for, for fun. You know, someone's no. going to come and, you know, make it a big thing for him to keep smashing and keep improving. But what is it about the stones? That is it his physique, his size? The thing, the thing I keep saying to people is, you know, I can coach a lot, but I can't be, I can't coach someone to be six foot eight with a seven foot wingspan. Like, <laughs> as much as I'd love to, like, Tom is built to be a ridiculously good stone lifter, but 
all the way, from what he said, all the way through his life as a strongman, he's just been able to switch on for Stones in a way that he couldn't for any other event. So this year, the big change is he basically treated every event like Stones and bought that aggression and bought what he needed to. But I don't know what it is. Like, in the nicest possible way, he's just a bit of a freak. Like, he, he can just lift Stones better than anyone who's ever lived. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's incredible, and for for it to be that event, it's such an iconic event with World Strongman, the Atlas Stones, to be so dominant. Yeah, it, it's, it's the event of strongman. You know, if people hear the word strongman, the first question is, is that where you pick those big concrete balls up? Yeah, iconic. Yeah, yeah, it's it's incredible. Is is there anything you got any thoughts on this? I've spoken to a lot of high profile athletes, and obviously. Luke got Tom into strongman and Luke, I think five times Scottish strongest man. And yeah. we know Luke's been there, done it and got the t-shirt and still continues to perform. But Luke got Tom into strongman and there's every chance that Tom wouldn't have gone down that route. You know, I've spoken no, it's to football, I think. Yeah. And, I, and I've spoken to athletes, a famous uh, Chrissy Wellington, a world famous triathlete. And she wasn't a triathlete. And someone saw her run and someone then saw her, why don't you try the bike? Why don't you try it going in the pool? And she became the best, one of the best ever. And it kept yeah. on, strongman found Tom. Yeah, it was. Uh... And I just think there's something in that, that. These people that get to the top of the world, their, their sport finds them or something happens along the way and it keeps them on the path. And I think it's so interesting. That... Yeah, it's, um, I think, you know, a lot of, I mean, on one level, all of the credit should go to Luke for getting him into it. But I think, you know, if you believe in it, like it was written somewhere that he would be. And he's, yeah, finding it and doing what he's done is absolutely incredible. At 27 as well, like he's not good yet. He's got like eight years before he gets really good. So I was going to say, what, what, I mean, is there a peak? Is it mid thirties? Sort of mid thirties? Like 35 ish. Like tendons need to get thicker and you need to get, you know, used to being under that much stress. But it seems that the people who really thrive, you know, at like 21, 22 are out of the sport fairly quickly. Whereas, you know, that slow build, basically what Tom and Luke have been doing mm -hmm. is just constantly getting better. It allows them to hit a point of, you know, mid to late thirties where they'll be really dangerous. So he's just warming up. That's what's yeah. great. Exciting. He's just yeah, warming it's, up. It's not. <laughs> isn't it? He's got a few, he's got a few titles under his belt, a Scotland strongest man, all that sort of stuff. He's now done worlds. Brian Shaw's got four. Four yeah, strongest four man. world's that, strongest. Is that man. the most? Is that the most? Uh, uh, Big Z's got four. Magnus for Magnuson's got four, and Marius Pudjanowski got five. But oh, okay, he got his five during a phase of strongman called the IFSA split, which is where some strongman stayed. Some strongmen, sorry, stayed with world's strongest man, and some went with a federation called IFSA. Um, so. There's arguments about, you know, if so and so was competing in worlds, would Puds have got five? Or, mm. but you can't really argue that, you know, Marius is one of the greatest strongmen who's ever lived. But I think Big Z and Brian are sort of the pinnacle of like greatest of all time strongmen. Yeah, they're they're pretty legit. Those guys, they're pretty yeah. real. And even Brian for the performance he put in this year, to, to oh, keep stunning. coming back, to keep coming back. And what's he's is he late thirties now? He's an older. I'm not sure. I think he's older. Yeah, he, um, he's been at it a long time. But he, it's really weird because of a fan of a sport. Like I'd love Brian to get five titles, but I really don't want him to. Yeah, like, it's well, he, that, he might not with Tom around. You know, if no, Tom, if I can't. Tom... I can't see anyone. Weirdly, the only person I can imagine beating Tom at the moment, if he you know, if this next year goes to plan, is Luke. So it's going to be a slightly more stressful year next year, I think. Yeah, he's got his big brother chasing him, chasing him down. Yeah. What, um, so you've spoken to Tom since. What sort of mindset was he and how soon did you get in touch with him after he picked up the trophy and won it? Uh, I managed to get about a 10-second phone call with him uh, 
fairly soon after. Yeah. Um, in between interviews, and yeah, from what I could tell, I think he was in tears, um, absolutely buzzing. And all he said, he was like, "I've." He went, um, "I did it, mate. I, I beat him." And then I was just bawling. I was like. <laughs> I don't know how to cope with this. Like, <laughs> like I'm good with no emotion, like straight down the middle sound. But yeah, I was, yeah, it, like for everyone involved, it was really emotional. And I think Tom's going to be buzzing for, for a long, long time about this because he's the world's strongest man. Like that's it. Yeah, that's, I mean, if he was to never compete again, it's a legacy yeah. that will live with him forever. It's an incredible achievement. Yeah, you don't get it taken away. No. Like, that's it. It's incredible. And what about Luke? You said you spoke to him about 20 minutes ago. What's what's he up to just now? How's he doing? Uh, I think he'd just been napping because I got home this early hours of this morning. But he, from what I can tell and what he says, he feels incredible. You know, he's put in the performance of his life and the overriding feeling uh, amongst a lot of fans and everyone is... Luke's positioning in the event doesn't reflect the quality of his performance. Like, you know, the odd little slip here and there with such a good field of athletes, you know, ended up with him being seventh. But, you know, one more rep here, a little bit quicker on this. You know, a lot of 1% would have put him in the mix for the podium and for first place. So it's... uh, it's just amazing, like such a good result, such an amazing performance as well. And, and you were asking, what's the plan now? And so you tar- you already target World's Strongest Man next year and you've got to get the stepping stones in the other events. So you've got the Arnold Classic, which is a, a, um, a major event, but what else is sort of, what's next for them? The I'll find out in the next two or three days, I think, exactly what exactly what the plan is, what events they want to do. Um whether they're going to go down to the events, you know, for Tom as world's strongest man to go and do the meet and greets and, you know, be, be who he is or yeah. whether they're going down as competitors. Um, but right now I'm not sure. Training starts on Monday. That's all I know, but there's no, uh, no stress for the next three days for them, I think. And Okay. Take us there. Training. Is that, rebuild refocus strengthen again or do you just go heavier from world's strongest man how do you view this next block what what, what do they so, sort of need to get in order we think they're well i think they're up for doing the competition at the royal albert hall all right and that's only in three or four weeks so um what we'll do is just get straight into just get straight into getting ready for that competition. So that's one of the times where it'll be super specific training because they've announced the events uh, last year and then had to move move the show to this year because of uh, the lockdown situation. Yeah. So we know what the actual events are going to be. So they'll have three or four weeks just totally focused on that one thing. Okay. And what about yourself? And you, I know you've got, have you got, you've got your own gym. What's, what's yeah. your situation and where are you actually based and how has this impacted you? You're obviously busy. You're going to yeah. be a fan, but have you had time to sort of reflect on how this might change your career and your life? Um, yeah, so we've, me and my partner own a gym in Sheffield, um, but we're not, it's not really a gym. It's a space where, you know, sort of certain members can come and train. We've got, you know, Olymp- uh, an Olympian, uh, Commonwealth Games athlete, hopeful some world-class power lifters and stuff so we keep it really small uh she my partner runs um like women's only weightlifting club she's run it for years so you know that's what's keeping the gym that's the main point of the gym really is to give mm-hmm. that space for people to train uh but for me i just went climbing pretty much switched off and just enjoyed you know, loads of messages and loads of stuff going on. And I just wanted a couple of hours to enjoy enjoy the result and go and have a little sit and, yeah, just try and chill out and figure out what to do next. And Because I'm, I'm really bad at this sort of stuff, you know, like I'd never think about asking to go on stuff or wanting to 
put myself out. I just like helping people get stronger. So I'm trying to figure out a way that works for me to actually do a bit more. Well, it's I mean ha- having athletes like Tom and Luke. You, we talked we touched on it earlier. They are the kindest guys, you know. And, yeah. And you couldn't be part of a a more well thought of team, in my opinion. From always sort of looking in from afar, speaking to the guys, keeping in touch with them, sort of every now and again, well done, good luck this weekend, and all that sort of stuff. And the kids send up videos and encouragement and all and all that because my kids they love the strong man. They're all yeah. like my two boys. One of them's Luke. One of them's Tom. That, that's what the kids do. You know, when they're watching yeah. football, they've got their favorite players. They know who Tom and Luke Stoltman are. They're role models to future generations of of strength and kids coming through and eat healthy and do the right things. For you to have them to, uh, and I'm sure that, that they want to see you do so well. You know. Yeah, I th- I think so. I just like I said, I just I really like helping people and getting people stronger and helping them achieve their goals. And Mm -hmm. that's sort of been what I've focused on is just wanting to help people a bit, but it's sort of left this big void of, you know, I post stuff on Instagram and then post stuff I probably shouldn't post and call people out on stuff and, you know, do all of this. But it's like, well, I don't see myself as this public figure. I'm just, some guy who messes about on rocks and tells people to lift stuff up. Like it's yeah. Learning what I can do and what I should be doing, I think is a, a big step to get my head around. It's almost working out where you want to be and visualizing yeah. how you want your personal career to develop. Yeah. And I'm not really sure currently, you know, I know what I want to be involved in, but I'm not really sure at what capacity. Um, so I'm pretty open to stuff and, you know, people say, oh, you should do YouTube, you should write a book, you should do this. I'm like, I'm really happy just climbing rocks and helping other people. Like, I don't, I, yeah, I need to find where I fit and what to do with it. Your own personal journey, what you, you spoke about at the start, I didn't see it coming, you know? No, you, people you, don't really. <laughs> I, I didn't, obviously, I, I followed you, I knew you were their strength coach part of the team and as soon as I saw you answering all the Instagram posts and you were just so you were so good at getting back to people and talking knowledgeably and everything you were responding and then obviously I sent my message saying do you want to do this there was nothing there that I knew that you've you've had you've had a dark past you know but there's something in that that's you have you have not it's I don't know it's it's whether you want to use it you've got a platform now yeah I think you know everyone's got a dark past in some way and I sort of just saw it as normal. Like I might've gone a bit extreme with it, but you know, people have got stuff going on. Like, yeah, yeah, I've never really thought about it as a, a thing, if that makes sense. It's just part of what I've sort of had to do to get to where I am. Yeah. You've had to take through and and do you cope with, with, with your, or your, how, how do I describe it? When you say you're on the spectrum, do, do you cope well in, in like if you were at the world's strongest man and you're watching, are you good in that environment? Yeah, that's where I want to be. You want to be, you yeah, want to yeah. be right beside your athletes. You want to be in the mixer. Yeah. You're on it. That's your, yeah. your playground. That's where you want to be. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. So. Stress is, stress is good. Like I absolutely love it. Like it okay. is really freaks out my other half. So under pressure, and is that part of rock climbing? You like a bit of the danger. You like a bit of the yeah, yeah. To, I I freak out, you know, if I'm five or six feet off the floor, and then uh, about a month ago I was climbing on Clogwin Durathri, which is on the side of Snowdon, a big cliff there, and you know we're two hundred and fifty feet up. If you fall off, you and the guy belaying you is going to die, and I was like. Oh, this is amazing. Look how nice the view is. Like, just crack on. Just don't fall off. Like, if it's, I sort of need stuff to be a bit hectic to, you know, I was saying before, I was trying to slow my brain down to the speed the world worked at. But if I'm in a situation where the world's working at the speed my brain is, I'm, I'm happy, man. That's where I want to be. 
that's your comfort zone. And, and you talked about, I saw an Instagram post about being comfortable and un- how is it comfortable while uncomfortable? Yeah. That, <laughs> that might have butchered that. But no, so when you think things are fast paced, so like a world's strongest man event, lifting the heaviest things of all time, you want to be right there in the mixer. Yeah, I, I hated it this year because I wasn't there. Yeah. Whereas if I'm there, I can, I'll, I'll know what the scores are, like straight away. I'll find who does the scores and I'll buy them a cup of tea and I'll make friends with them and I want the scores. Like, I'll get, like, if I'm there, I can sort it all out. But sat refreshing a spreadsheet was, yeah, not, not great. <laughs> not easy for you. Well, it's an interesting story and it's, I'm, I'm so glad I asked you to come on because, like I say, I think that I'm going to get a guy that's, he's a strength coach and he's done it all his life and, you know, that's all I do and you don't get much about their own history, their own past and, and what you've gone through to sort of pull on your dark side to bring the best out in other people. And that's, yeah, it's, that's what you're doing for the lads. That's it, you know, I said to... I've said to Luke and, and Tom, actually, you know, doing like, you know, those endurance pain events yeah. where you've just got to sit. I was like, when it starts to hurt, that's when you'll start enjoying it. Like, live in that. Because no one else is willing to occupy that space. Like, people, humans don't want to be in that space. So if you can become happy in that, then you'll, be, you'll win before you start, you know? That's the old Muhammad Ali. You would only start counting sit-ups and press-ups when it started hurting. Yeah. No. I, was, um, I really, I did um, some freestyle wrestling uh, for a while um, and competed in that for a year or so. And uh, there was a guy, I think it was Kerry Kolat, an American wrestler, and they went out to Russia to uh, for a world championship. And they said there was one of the Russian guys sat in the sauna, just quiet just staring at the wall, silent. And like the Americans would go in and they'd be like 30 seconds and they'd be like sweating, so unhappy and they'd be shouting and screaming and they'd go in the cold tub and they'd be, you know, howling that they're in the cold water. And they said this Russian guy just stood up, strolled into the cold water, like made no noise, head under, washed himself, walked back into the sauna. And Kerry Kolak said like, he'd, I knew then he'd win. Like, I can't beat that. <laughs> you beat them before the, the event even started. Psychology. 100%, yeah. Psychology. That's, and, and there's the old Kobe Bryant uh, stories and things like that. He'd be at the, he'd be at the stadium th- three hours before, before um, the basketball match would start. Yeah. And the guys would start warming up his opposition. They'd see Kobe's there. He'd never stop. He'd never stop. They would finish and he'd still be training. And yeah. then we talk after the game, after Kobe's put 50 points down and the, the Lakers have won. Um, they would speak to Kobe and they say, Why were you training? He said, So I you knew I would never quit. And I beat you, yeah. before, I beat you before we started. It's it really seems it, it seems to be a common theme with people who are pretty awesome at what they do. You know, I know uh, I'm a massive, like absolutely massive fan of Nims um and what he's done. And reading his book and listening to way too many podcasts about it you know you realize that when it's hard and when he's suffering he's good like that's when Mm. that's when he switches on and that's when he does amazing things and it seems you know with athletes who are really good just everyone has that thing of you just don't get to quit yeah yeah and and they become the best there's ever been yeah yeah there is a pattern there it sort of accidentally become better than anyone who's ever lived like it works out quite well what what's the pressure like on you and apologies if i'm sure you've thought about this but what's the pressure like on you to keep tom as the strongest man in the world um it's a weird one because you know as we saw with alexi this year yeah he to him he just had a bad competition and it happened to be world's strongest man he wasn't strong enough you know he said all this for me, all I want to do with both Tom and Luke is just keep them improving. And if it happens that there's, you know, eight absolute freaks and the events are awful and they come like last, but they've improved in their own performance, then I'm happy. You know, so long as I'm doing my job and making them improve and they're just constantly getting better, then 
and that's that's what I want to do. Well said, well said, Dan. Well, Dan, I really appreciate you coming on, and I hope you go on to do many more podcasts. Tell your story because you're good at it. You're, you're really Cheers, good. At it. You've got an awesome story. Thanks for the feedback from my interview with Nims Burge. I really appreciate that. That was that was really kind. I of love to, it, man. To reach He's, out. Uh, and that. And yeah, what a guy. And what I enjoyed is it wasn't just a you've walked up that big hill and loads of other big hills. I bet that was hard. Like you actually got into, you know, what's going on and chatting to Nims, not some guy who's gone up loads of hills really quickly. Yeah, it interests me. That's what I love doing this show. I love I can reach out to anybody. It's it's completely mine as I sit here in, in, in my house recording it and it's you can reach out and you get rejection, you get no's and then you get awesome interviews and chats like 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 we've just had and I find out something oh, about you man. that that inspires me that you know you can go into this dark place come out and 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 work hard and grind and and get around an amazing team of people and get the best people around you and increase yeah no, that and, means a lot man and you can achieve incredible things yeah no thank you that really means a lot I appreciate that I just I just have mess about on rocks and tell folk what to pick up well, keep, uh... keep doing it it's working <laughs> keep doing yeah. it well here sure you'll speak to Tom and Luke well before I do please wish them all the best from me I will do man good luck with everything that's to come I'm going to keep in touch with you and we'll do this again sometime yeah that'll be ace yeah you know where I am alright bud take care alright brilliant cheers thank you man <laughs>